time to worship the Lord. Yes, please stand. Let's engage our hearts this morning in praise and adoration of our King. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Welcome your presence here, Lord. We want to worship you.
This is Joseph Abood. He's been made new. Joseph, have you following Christ in baptism because you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior? I do. Because of that public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his command, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. I needed a rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break out the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, you called me a citizen. so thankful today for the goodness of the Lord. He says he has called us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. We've been saved, forgiven, set free by the power of Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross and what he did for us at that empty tomb. That's why we've gathered in this place today. It's going to be a powerful day in the presence of the Lord. He says when we gather like this, we sing these songs, we lift up praises and thanksgiving. He says his presence delights in. He inhabits our praise. The Almighty God is with us today. And that's why we sing. That's why we celebrate, lift our hands, clap, and we look to His Word that is life to us. So this is going to be a powerful day in His presence. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us. If you're our guest today, we especially welcome you. We're so glad you're here. We've been praying for you to join us. In the Prestonwood Today program you received, there's a little tear-off section called guest registration. We would love for you to fill that out. And as you leave today, take that to Guest Central because we have a gift we want to give you, one of Dr. Graham's books. We as a church family want to come alongside you and your family in any way that we can to serve you. That's why we're here. And if you're joining us at Prestonwood.live all around the world, we trust you sense God's presence right there where you are. Enter in, sing along, pray with us. And as we look to God's word, we know that you're going to be transformed and lifted up today as well. Right here in the Plano campus, it might be a little cloudy outside, but the lights are on in here, and God's presence is with us. Why don't you take and find somebody around you you haven't met, introduce yourself, and welcome them today. We're really glad you're here. As we continue to sing to the Lord today, 
We come into his presence only by his name and his grace and his mercy. There's power in his name. There's healing in his name, forgiveness, salvation. There is no higher name in the name of Jesus. Let's sing this together. Lost our say, find their way at the sound of your great name. Broken down, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy.
church, we're praising the great name of our Lord and Savior. This is what it's all about. The scripture says, you have exalted above all things, O God, your word and your name. I want you to go ahead and be seated. Our pastor is going to be bringing a message here in just a few moments on the excellent name of Jesus. It's why we do everything that we do. We go in his name. We serve in his name. We worship in his name. And we give in his name. And before our men come to receive the morning offering, giving our all-in talk today is Marcus Laughlin. He and his wife, Glenda, have been members here for 23 years. Uh, he has taught in a Bible fellowship class on Saturday night since we made the transition around 10 or 15 years ago. He has served as our chairman of the deacons. When we talk about being all in, uh, Marcus and his family are certainly all in. Would you welcome to the platform as he shares his heart, Marcus Laughlin. Thank you, Jared. Good morning, church family. If you're one of those that keeps track of all the critical national news every day, surely you couldn't have missed September the 22nd. Yesterday was National Ice Cream Cone Day. Uh, I certainly didn't miss it. My wife, Glenda, can tell you that uh, I'm all in when it comes to a freshly made waffle cone and a, a generous scoop of vanilla ice cream. Uh, but I can tell you, 23 years ago, uh, the Laughlin family was led here to Prestonwood, and we've had the privilege to be all in uh, for Christ in, in various capacities of service, and uh, this is a very special place to our family. Uh, we love our pastor, we love our staff, we love our church family. This is a place where we raised our daughter. This is a place where uh, Bethany, our daughter, uh, placed her faith in Christ. This is a place where Bethany's love for missions was born. It's even a place where as she served on staff for a couple of years in the student ministry, she met her husband, TJ, uh, who was on staff at Awaken Church, one of Prestonwood uh, Network churches down in Charleston, South Carolina. And that's where she lives today with our uh, grandbaby, Ellie Grace, of 21 months. So we're very, very proud of them. But for being all in to me stems from a deep gratitude that I have for what Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago on the cross. Now, he suffered for me, he died for me, and was raised again on the third day. And I can never repay him, but he gave me everything. Uh, he owns everything. He owns me, he owns you, and he is everything to me. And uh, we worship him, and uh, being all in is about discovering and developing and deploying your spiritual gifts that God has given you, uh, along with the passions he's given you, what you enjoy doing in the service of the body. And that's been our blessing over the years. For me, it's teaching. Uh, we started a, a married adult class uh, back at Hillcrest in Arapahoe on Sunday mornings. And we moved that class to Saturday night when Pastor uh, moved to Saturday night service. And so I can tell you that if there were no rooms available for me to teach in in this church, I would literally teach in the parking lot in the rain. That's how much I enjoy teaching. And uh, God has given me a passion for that. I know he's given you a passion to serve him as well. And my challenge for this church is to continue to be faithful and being all in for him with our lives first and then our resources. Amen? I'm going to pray with me tonight, today. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you are sovereign. God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Father, you own everything. Father, we owe you everything. But, God, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of your work. Thank you for this place called Prestonwood. Thank you for our pastor, God, for his faithfulness and bringing the word. God, we just love him. We thank you, God, for this people. We ask you to maximize your kingdom in and through us uh, from this place forward unto the world. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
your hands have made the awesomeness of you and how your love will never fade new words cannot express how i feel inside i can't describe your glory divine but as a token of my love this is what i'll do
is all I've got to say. Jared just turned over to me and said while we were worshiping there at the end, uh, Jared Stevens said, you know what, if you hadn't been in church in a while and you walked in here today, your hair is on fire right now. I'm telling you, it is uh, just incredible to be in this place with God's people and to worship Christ. You know, our music, our worship here, the music, the message, it all connects and the word with the worship and song and the word in scripture, it all meshes. You know, the music, we never view this part of the service as uh, prelims, it's not. It's an essential part of the heart and life of our church engaging worship and thank you for joining in always. And uh, if you are a guest, we're really glad that you have joined us as well as those of you online at Prestonwood.live, 42 plus countries. Uh, tune in, people from all over the world and across America, of course, with PowerPoint, radio, and television. Uh, it just gets started here. We push the button and it goes literally to people everywhere. So welcome to everyone outside the room as well as everyone uh, in the room today. I'm very excited about this brand new series called Going uh, the Distance. Going the Distance. Developing a Muscular Faith. And it's all taken from the book of Hebrews, so I ask that you begin finding in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 1. It sounds like an Old Testament book, doesn't it? Hebrews. But it's a New Testament book written originally to Jewish Christians, Jewish believers and followers of Yeshua the Messiah. And the struggle they were facing now in the second generation of the Christian faith, after the apostles and disciples, this now the second generation of believers, many were facing persecution and trials and difficulties and just the challenges of life. And some wanted, some were turning back, going back to their old life, going back to their old religion, going backwards instead of forwards. The Christian life is always onward and upward. It is always forward. We don't live our past. We live in the present and in the power of God to the future. God has given us an incredible future. And when we came running out of that grave, you saying that? When we ran out of that grave, we began a race. Paul talked about it quite often, this race of the Christian life. He said, I have kept the faith. I have finished the course. I have fought the good fight. So this is a race. And the writer of this letter, this epistle to the Hebrews, you say, what in the world is an epistle? Well, an epistle is the wife of an apostle. No, not really. Uh, an epistle means a letter. And so this is like other New Testament book, a letter. We don't know the human author. We can debate it, discuss it, and it's kind of fun to do that. But we know God wrote the book. God gave us the Bible. All inspiration is given by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, breathed out by God, and is profitable. So that means Old Testament and New Testament, it all belongs to Him, and now it belongs to us because He has given us His Word. And Hebrews is at the heart of the Word of God, and it's one of the greatest, most powerful, theological, if you want to use that word, truth telling book in the Bible. Interesting, I've preached many, many times in the book of Hebrews, in and out over the years, many years, there are great passages, great scriptures, and I want to challenge you to read the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews. I want you to read it as we're going forward. The series is going to be this fall and winter, and who knows how long we're going to go. We're going to let the Holy Spirit lead us in that as to how we are preaching, but we are preparing in advance and to preach the whole book. And so while I've preached many times in and out, including the great 11th chapter, the roll call of the faithful, the hall of fame that's there of great believers in the past. Preached that, done that, biographical sketches, many of the verses, we've done that. But this is my first time ever to go top to bottom in Hebrews. It can be an intimidating book. There's a lot in here that you have to connect to the culture today and, and there's background information that you need to know, but don't let that intimidate you in any way. Just some of the Jewish references and the priestly references and, and, and the, the high priest Melchizedek and all those words that are confusing, especially if you may be a new believer or just getting started, you just started this race, it could be confusing, but we're going to take it apart a verse at a time because I'm telling you it's one of the greatest passages in all of the Bible. And we're calling it going the distance. Why? 
because this book was written to these believers early on and believers today who were threatened and therefore thinking that they might need to quit. The book of Hebrews is all about maturing and growing and going forward. Not ever going backwards because the Christian life, as I said, is always onward and upward. It is a race. And we didn't get in this race just to start the race. We're in it to finish the race, right? We want to finish the race. And we want to take our faith throughout our lives and grow our faith and have a muscular faith. In times like these, we need a tough faith. People talk about having, uh, being mentally tough. Well, that's important at, at many different levels. But more important is to be spiritually tough, to be strong in these days of unbelief. And there's a great deal of unbelief today. And I know you're being challenged uh, in your faith and, and, and getting your faith from where you are to where God wants it to be. That's the call uh, uh, to every Christian. I sat down with a young teenager this week. Uh, he's just 14 years of age. And I was talking to him about taking his faith from his childhood and now making sure, and your parents, and making sure that it's your own faith, that you are going forward with your faith, that you don't leave your faith back in your childhood. Unfortunately, that happens some. Somebody makes a decision in, in ch children's ministry, a vacation Bible school, they go to camp, it's all exciting, but they never get their faith forward out of their childhood into, into mature and maturing faith. Uh, or sometimes we go away to college and our faith is challenged for some the very first time. We're challenged as to what we believe and why we believe what we believe and, and doubts and, 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 and missiles uh, uh, of unbelief are hurled at us. Do we, we begin sometimes to question what we believe, question the Bible and our faith which could be weak if we didn't strengthen it along the way it just collapses in the face of all these doubts and all these uh, accusations regarding our faith. So some and there's statistics on this they grow up in church, they go away to university or college or into life and they leave their faith behind and they never come back. Hebrews is written so that that won't happen to you. Don't let this happen to you. Or in young adulthood, you get to midlife and life hasn't turned out the way you had expected and there's been disappointments and you haven't had the achievements. Maybe it's relational difficulties, problems in your life and, and, and you're at the middle of the race and you're just thinking, I, it's just not worth it to go on. I, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep going forward because life hurts too much or there are obstacles thrown in your way and, and, and difficulties distracting you and, and you're thinking, maybe some of you right now, you're at the midpoint of life, though you don't know where the midpoint actually is, but you know, you're at midlife. Some people have a quote midlife crisis there because there's such a crisis of being, an identity. So some want to go back or just quit altogether. I see it happen with empty nesters. You get the kids raised, the family's gone. Really, there's no need, we think. I don't need church anymore, the kids are raised. We need to travel more, we need to do more, I don't need church. And then you're just thinking anyway, was it really that valuable, did I really grow? And if you get to the empty nest and you're looking at a wife who may be a stranger to you or a husband that you don't know that well because you haven't grown your faith and developed your family, you may think, I'm just gonna quit. I'm gonna quit on life, I'm gonna quit on my marriage, I'm gonna quit on my faith, I'm gonna quit on my church. We have a lot of quitters today. And then you get to older age, old age. And you know you're playing in the fourth quarter. And you're looking at the future and you're looking at eternity and you're thinking, can I do this? You know, the aches, the pains, the illnesses, the tragedies that happen along the way. Can I keep going? Can I cross the finish line? Because if you're a believer, if, you're, if you have a faith in God, you don't want to just crawl to the finish line. You want to finish well. You want to finish with a burst. And the only way you can do that, the only way you can go the distance is to live the principles of God's Word. And Hebrews talks about this starting with the first and foremost foundational truth that will keep you going in life and in faith and is found in the first eight verses of Hebrews chapter 1. Are you ready? 
long ago. At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, and the last days are today, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also, watch this, created the world. He's the Christ of the cosmos. Jesus is the God of the galaxies. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Beautiful word there, radiant, the resplendent glory of God, shining like a light in the universe, in the world, the radiance of the glory of God, the beauty of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. He is exactly and perfectly God. The nature of God is imprinted and demonstrated, expressed in the person of Christ. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Mark that in the Bible. His name is a more excellent name. Sin has a name, but his name is greater than our sin. Sorrow has a name. Sickness has a name. Cancer, heart disease, a name. But his name is superior to any name, to anything you face. His name is above every name, more excellent name, a better name. You'll find as you read through Hebrews 13 times, the word better is used. There's nothing or no one better than Jesus. That'd be a good place for an amen. Is it, is it just quiet because it's raining? <laughs> There's nothing or no one better than Jesus. Come on, church, get into this. And verse 5, to which the angels did God ever say, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and verse 6 says, let all God's angels worship him. He's above the angels. Now, I've written a book about angels. I've studied the angels, and we'll bring a message on this. The fact is, he is way, way above the angels. The angels worship Jesus. And of the angels, he says, he makes the angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, this is about Jesus, your throne, O God, is forever and ever the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. This passage, can you imagine in such a small number of words a more powerful description of the greatness and the glory of Christ our God, our Savior, our King. This is a power-packed passage. And because Jesus came running out of that grave, he now has ascended. He is almighty God. He is seated at the right hand of God, having completed the work that God the Father had sent him to do. And in this passage of Scripture, we have the pre-incarnate glory of Christ. We have his incarnation, that is his birth. We have his life. We have his miracles. We have his deeds. We have his resurrection, his cross, his ascension, his return. It's all in this passage because this book, as introduced here, is all about the person and work of Jesus in your life. And Jesus is what keeps us going. The presence and the power of Jesus in our lives is what keeps us going the distance. He went the distance so that he would enable us to go the difference. Later on in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the founder and the protector of our faith. So as you're running this race, what are you doing? You're leaning into Jesus. You're looking to Jesus. Off Eyes off the obstacles and the problems and keeping your faith focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. That's where it ends. This is how we go the distance. And you have to start with Jesus before you can finish with Jesus. And it's impossible to live the Christian life without Jesus. 
So you need Jesus in your life. He is a superior Savior. He is a sovereign Savior. This is all about the supremacy and the superiority of Jesus. That there is nothing bigger, nothing better than Him. Sin is not better than Jesus. Nothing in life, no experience in your life is better than Jesus. Science is not better than Jesus. Philosophy is not better than Jesus. Science is not better than Jesus. Religion is not better than Jesus. He has a better name, a more excellent name. And that name is above every name. So how do we make this claim? Why would we make such a claim? Because God, first and foremost, has spoken to us in Jesus. God is speaking through Jesus. When verse 2 says in these last days he has spoken to us by his son we reflect upon the ways that God has spoken through the ages. He has spoken in creation. We know that. You look up into a starry night you see the beauty and the glory of of creation. The psalmist said the heavens declare the glory of God, the greatness of God, the glory of God is seen in the heavens and the firmament is always speaking of God's presence and creation speaks, uh, the cosmos speaks of order and design and a creator. So you look up and and only a fool would look uh, at the greatness, whether it's the the, the majesty of mountains or the vastness of the oceans or, or, or whether it is the, the, the magnificence of the stars or even the beauty in the face of a baby. You look at that and you see the creation and you know that God is, that God exists. And so God speaks through his creation. God speaks into the soul of the human being. He has set eternity in our hearts. Animals do not possess that faculty to relate to God. But we have a conscience, something speaking inside of us, reflecting what is right, what is wrong. There is a normal, natural humanness that God created us in His image that enables us to relate to God at some level. So our conscience speaks to us. And everyone has a conscience. That conscience can be seared, it can be destroyed. But the fact is God made you with the capability to believe and to trust and a conscience to know what is right, what is wrong. God speaks. He is not silent. He speaks from day to day. He has spoken from eternity. He speaks by His Spirit. He has spoken to us in various ways. He's spoken to us, of course, in the Bible. He talks here of the patriarchs and the prophets. In times past, way back, God spoke to us. And the reference, of course, is to the Old Testament. And we believe all of the Bible is God's Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible is not a human book. It's a holy book. It's not just a book. It's a Jesus book. It's, it's not just a good book. It's God's book. And therefore, when you read the Bible, God speaks. And when the prophets, in the Old Testament, God spoke in divergent ways, a diversity of ways, whether it was miracles or great stories. When I was a little boy, uh, I, I would, my grandfather would, would read the scriptures typically, typically every evening, and I just reveled in the adventures of the Bible, those great stories of the Old Testament. And, and I, we had a book, a Bible story book called Hurlbut's Story of the Bible, and, and we would read that, and I'd look at the pictures, and, and I'd get so fired up as, as a little boy just, just reading these stories of the Bible but ultimately that's partial. The, old, the stories, the history, the greatness, the prophets, the patriarchs, the planets, all of that is partial understanding of who God is. Just concerning nature, creation, a sunrise, a sunset, a beautiful soft falling rain, that says one thing about God, but Nature is ambivalent and we live under the curse of sin and the creation. The globe is groaning under the curse of this sin and therefore what does a hurricane say about God? What is a terrible storm that threatens lives and tornadoes and and disasters and tsunamis and all the rest? So you see if you just had nature 
you wouldn't know exactly what God was like. You might understand His greatness and, and even His glory at some level, but you really wouldn't know from the planets, the planetary system, what God was like. And even the patriarchs and the prophets, that's progressive revelation. That's, that is not complete until, until Jesus came. And that's why we read in these verses, in these days, in these last days, and the last days began the moment Jesus was born. We're in the last days. In these days, He has spoken to us through His Son. God speaks through His Son. And of all the planets in the universe, and it's more vast than the human mind can understand, we've made advances looking in to the planetary system. I have a little grandson, two of them, twins, Jake and Zach. And Jake is fascinated. He's just three, but he's fascinated with the planets. He's got them memorized. I actually kind of forgot all the planets, but he can name them and he's getting me to name them again. And he names them all, Earth, and goes through, and then he gets to Pluto. And then he stops and he says, but Daddy Jack, Pluto's not a planet. I said, really, Pluto's not a planet? Because he's heard somewhere, read somewhere already that Pluto is in question. People are questioning Pluto. Did you know that? Whether it's just a big rock in the sky or whether it's a planet. Now, I think they said it's a planet. But Jake says, no, it's not a planet. So right now, I'm believing Jake. I actually thought Pluto was a dog. But be that as it may, of just our planets and our solar system, God chose Earth. God so loved the world and the people. On planet Earth, that He spoke to us and sent His Son. And in Jesus, you have the fullness and the focus and the foreverness of God. All He is the Word of God. That's the way John, the disciple, who looked into his eyes, John wrote in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. And there was not anything made that was made except by Him. The Word. It all comes down to this Word. The Word of Jesus. Jesus explains God. Jesus exegetes God. It's a beautiful thing to consider. Kent Hughes, speaking of the Christ in creation, said, He is the cosmic eloquence of God. In creation, we see the cosmic eloquence of God. Intelligence and design. But the final word, the full word, the forever word is Jesus. It's all in Him. The Old Testament reveals God in history and hymnology, in the hope of a Savior that is to come. The Old Testament says someone is coming, the Gospels say someone has come. And the letters and the revelation say someone is coming again. And this one, Jesus, is the heir of all things. That is, everything was made by him and is coming to him. God. I know that there are people who question God today. They tell me they're more atheists today than ever. I don't know if that's true or not. But my friend Jay John sent me this this week and it's so good, I just had to share it with you. It's called the, a parable of the concept of God. I'm going to call it the word from the womb. In a mother's womb were two babies. One asked the other, do you believe in life after delivery? The other replied, well, of course, there has to be something after delivery. Maybe we are here to prepare ourselves for what will be later. Nonsense, said the first. There is no life after delivery. What kind of life would that be? And the second said, I don't know, but there will be more light than here. 
Maybe we will walk with our legs and eat from our mouths. Maybe we will have other senses that we can't understand right now. And the first replied, that's absurd. Walking is impossible. Eating with our mouths, ridiculous. The umbilical cord supplies nutrition and everything we need, but the umbilical cord is so short. Life after delivery is to be logically excluded. The second insisted, well, I think there's something and maybe it's different than it is here. Maybe we won't need this physical cord anymore. The first replied, nonsense. And moreover, if there is life, then why has no one ever come back from there? <laughs> delivery is the end of life. And in the after delivery, there is nothing but darkness and silence and oblivion. It takes us nowhere. Well, I don't know, said the second. But certainly we will meet mother and she will take care of us. The first replied, mother? You actually believe in mother? That's laughable. If mother exists, then where is she now? The second said, she's all around us. We're surrounded by her. We are of her. It is in her that we live. Without her, this world would not and could not exist. Said the first, well, I don't see her. So it's only logical that she doesn't exist. To which the second replied, watch this, sometimes when you're in silence and you focus and listen, you can perceive her presence and you can hear her loving voice calling down from above. God is speaking. Some of you may have denied him and say he doesn't exist, that you can't hear from him. The biggest question in life is how can I know God? Is there a God? And if there is a God, how can I know him? If he's so great and grand and glorious and big and out there and runs the universe, how could he possibly care about me and how does he know me and how can I know him? There's a name and his name is Jesus. And God saves through Jesus. God speaks through Jesus. He's fully and finally spoken in Christ who he is and what he has done, the God-man, infinite and eternal God-man. This is the incarnation when God became a human being in Christ. He went to the cross. He died on the cross. That's the good news. He died for our sins. So God saves through Jesus. And the Bible says there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Religion cannot save. Philosophy will not save. Personality change and psychological rearmament, that, that, that won't really change you ultimately. Only Jesus can save. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so the writer says, God says in this word, that after he revealed God, he redeemed man. He saved us. He purged us is the old word in the Bible, the King James. And here it, it, it speaks of the purification of sin. The Hebrews, the Jewish people talked a lot, thought a lot about forgiveness and how, how they could be washed clean from their sins. And there were many sacrifices including purification rites and all the rest. And so the writer says to these Christians who were thinking about going back to their old way of life, he said, remember, only Jesus purified your sins. Only Jesus purged you from your sin. You can't change yourself. You can't get through that addiction without the power of Jesus in your life. You can't get through your sin. Jesus only. So he, his blood on the cross cleanses us from, from every sin. The word purge there is a, is a very interesting word. Uh, the word purgatory, you ever heard that word? 
purgatory uh, comes from this idea of purging from your sins. And, 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 and a religion, frankly the Catholic religion, came up with this idea centuries ago that there is a purgatory. It's totally man-made. It's not in the Bible, never taught in the Bible. But that somehow when you die there's an intermediate state and you don't go straight to heaven or straight to hell. You go to purgatory and there you, your sins could be purged. People could pay and pray. You, you pay enough money to the church, we'll pray your, your sister, your daughter, your husband, we'll pay them out of purgatory. How crazy is that? That's false. It's heretical. Purgatory. I heard about it when I was just a little kid, five or six years old. I don't know if I heard it at church or if my parents taught it, my grandfather. And there was a little Catholic boy across the street by the name of Donnie for Aldehoven. And I used to wear Donnie out every day about purgatory. I got my preaching spurs right there. I'm telling him, I said, Donnie, there's no purgatory. Oh, yes, there is. No, there's no purgatory. Yes, there is. No, there is. I said, Donnie, when you die, you're going to heaven or hell. You don't have any in between. Which one are you going? That's when I became an evangelist. I hope Donnie's listening or watching right now. Donnie, there's no purgatory. There isn't. Because nobody can pay off your sins. No human being can die for your sins or pray for your sins to be forgiven. Only Jesus purges us, purifies us from our sins. It's a better name. Better than religion. Better than science or philosophy. Better than sin. It's all in Jesus. He saves us from our sins. Past, present, and future. And it says he sat down the right hand of the majesty on high signifying that he ascended into the presence of the father he has sat down in the place of authority victory supremacy and sovereignty Jesus Christ is king he is Lord no wonder he has a more excellent name no wonder the Bible says there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Say that's narrow. Okay, all truth is narrow. There are many ways to Jesus. Many ways to get to Jesus. Many of it, it's one of the things I love about being a pastor. I see all the ways that God brings people to Jesus. There are many ways to Jesus, but Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And one final word in wrapping up. I told you there was a lot in this. God speaks through Jesus. God saves through Jesus, purifying our sins. He finished the work and he sustains and secures through Jesus. You see that little phrase there? I I believe it's in verse 3 where it says, He upholds all things by the word of his power. You see those verses when it talks about his sovereignty and his majesty and his supremacy and how he holds all things, he upholds all things. Now don't think of, the, uh, of Atlas putting the world on his shoulders. Not like that. But the scriptures tell us in the book of Colossians that by him all things hold together. All things consist. I think we're going to put that uh, scripture up for you. Uh, in Jesus, Colossians chapter 1, all things, there it is, hold together. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And all things were created through him, and watch this, and in him all things hold together. What holds the universe together? You say gravity. God holds it together. God set We call them the laws of nature or the laws of science. There are no laws of nature, only the laws of God that science uncovers. Gravity. That's God holding everything together. If Jesus took his hand off this planet, we would spin into oblivion. He holds everything together. He's got it. Now what about you? If you're going to go the distance, You need to be strong at the core and you need to make sure that he's holding you together. Maybe you're wondering, why don't things work out for me? Why are things always spinning out of control? 
why, why in the world is, is my marriage falling apart? Why in the world is my life falling apart? Why, why isn't my life, why can't I get it together? If you don't have Jesus, you'll never get it together. He holds everything together. He's the core. If you don't have Christ at the core, if you don't have Christ at the center of your life, everything's going to be spinning out of control constantly. But you get Christ in your heart, in your soul, in your being, and life starts holding together. There's problems, sure. There's difficulties, challenge, but he's there to put us back together, to hold us on so that we can keep going when we feel like giving up. So that we can go the distance and finish the race. His name is Jesus. God speaks through this more excellent name. He saves through this excellent name and he strengthens, secures, and sustains us through this excellent name. Just as he sustains the world's he will strengthen and sustain you. That is how you're going to go the distance.